to the First Presbyterian Church of Alpena. This is the 16th of May, 2021, and it's the seventh Sunday of Easter, and hence the white pyramids and the white stole. I wanted to let you know that we are back to having in-person services. Uh, they begin this week, and we plan on continuing them out uh, ad infinitum forever as long as we can and uh, but we also plan on continuing to do services online so if you can't make it we understand and we invite you to join us as you are joining us today at this service at the First Presbyterian Church welcome call to worship we are called to be one people coming together to publicly worship the Lord our God. And so we gather, and so we meet in this sacred space, set apart for worship and fellowship. Though God is everywhere and always, it is when we are gathered that we can be the, feel the palpable presence of the Lord. So let us worship God. Our first hymn today is Awake, My Soul and With the Sun. take or sit in the company of mockers but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night that person is like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither 
whatever they do prospers. The wicked are like chaff that the wind blows away. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Call to confession. The Lord watches over our ways. Let us put our trust in God's grace and confess our sins before God and one another. Prayer of Confession Eternal God, though you call us to delight in your teachings, we can become cynical and full of doubt. We try not to go our own way and do our own thing. We fail to follow your word. Do not judge us, we pray but help us and restore us to you. Guard us and protect us from evil and sanctify us in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Assurance of pardon. In Christ Jesus, God has promised to forgive us and reconcile us to our faith and to each other. With joy, let us share in God's grace as we live out our lives in dedication to the Lord. May the reading of your word sanctify us in the truth. Lord, open our minds to receive it so that it may awaken in us obedience and perfect joy. Amen. Our first reading today is from 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 through 13. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is the greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts his testimony. Whoever does not believe, has, God has made him out to be a liar, because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is a testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has a Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Our second reading for the day is from the Gospel of John and it's chapter 17 verses 6 through 19. And this reading comes from a prayer that Jesus was giving up to the Lord near the end of his ministry. And this is what he writes, what John writes. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given to me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. 
I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. They have given them, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is true. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. This, my friends, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My friends, it's so good to be back together again, back in our own church, back in our own sanctuary this Sunday. And we are together. And you heard me talk about this before. There's two types of relationships in our faith. There's that vertical relationship between us and God. And we exercise that all the time when we pray, when we read the word, when we think about God in our off moments, but there's also horizontal relationships. So not only do we have this relationship with God that's important to our faith, but our relationships with each other. And that's what I'm talking about in a horizontal relationship. And I think of it as kind of like a cross. Uh, the, the standing up part is our relationship with God and the horizontal part is our relationship with each other. I think we have other relationships too. We have relationships with places, don't we? Because we are somehow invested in them. Like we have a relationship with our house, our home, our apartment, whatever it happens to be, our, our hometown, right? Yes, we do. And why do we have that relationship? It has to do not just with things, not just with structures, but the people that we see there at home, who do we see? You know, we see our family. And we have this investment of ourselves, our own time and our own money in that house, our own furniture, our own wall hangings, right? So we have a relationship with home. We have a relationship with school. If we're a student, or maybe we were a student at a university some time ago and, and we still maintain that relationship. Somebody says, oh, you know, where were you educated at? And somebody will say University of Michigan. Somebody else will say state. Yeah, maybe go head to head on that. But yes, you have this loyalty to that. You have a relationship with that school, even though you may have been gone for 40, 50 years. <laughs> In our own community, we have relationships with libraries, right? A lot of people who just love the library. I know my wife happens to be one of them. We have relationships with parks and lakes and rivers and mountains and buildings, all kinds of things, even roads and sidewalks, places to walk. All of that we have a relationship with. Even the geese, I think we have a relationship with them at the parks as well, but they're not places, are they? So, and, but you know, there's another place that we have a huge relationship with, and that is with our church building, with our sanctuary here, where we are worshiping God. And why do we have that? It's because we sense a holy presence here. It's not that God isn't everywhere, because God is everywhere, but it is here because of this place that we feel that presence perhaps more than we might feel it elsewhere. And when we have a place like this, 
where we feel there is God, that God is here, we call it holy, don't we? We call it holy because there is something special and sanctified that is here. Do you know what holy really means? What it really means, what it literally means, is set apart. So in this church, in this sense, our church is holy because we have set it aside for specific purposes. We don't come in here and have parties. We don't come in here and do uh, aerobics, do we? We come in here to worship God. We set it aside for the contemplation of higher things, whether that be music, especially religious music. Uh, we, we come here, I will sometimes come in here and just sit and read the Bible, and I invite you to do the same anytime that the church is open and that you are so inclined. Come here to pray because you will feel the presence of God here. You will feel it at home too, kneeling beside your bed, sitting in your armchair, but here, here, we have set this place aside for those higher feelings, for those higher connections, for that connection with God and our connection with each other. So that's what this place is for, right? Now in our reading today, Jesus is praying to God. In fact, chapter 17, the entire chapter is a prayer by Jesus to God. And this, what, we, what I read earlier, is only just a piece of that. It's the middle piece, actually, because Jesus prays for himself, then he prays for the disciples, and then he prays for all believers. And this prayer was delivered at the Last Supper. And it reveals some of what must have been on his mind just before the crucifixion. Speaking of the disciples, he says that he has given them God's word. And the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than Jesus is of the world. And a, a common way to phrase this is that we, as God's people, are in the world. See, we are in the world. We are here, right? But we are not of the world. So when Jesus is talking about being in and of the world, just what is he talking about? What's he thinking? First, we must have a sense of what the world is. Now, when we think of the world, I'm not talking about just a planet. I'm talking about this universe that we inhabit, the stars, the moons, the sun, and the sky, right? And the sun warms us up, and then what else surrounds us? And what is the result of the, the sun beating down and, and causing the rain and, and causing crops to grow and buildings and shelters and animals? That's the physical universe that we inhabit. And it's all part of creation. It is our environment. And we, as people, are surrounded by it all the time. We move through it constantly. And we even manipulate parts of it for our own benefit. Going to the grocery store, or if you're a farmer, planting crops, or if you're a hunter, you know, bringing home that deer, right? <clears throat> so we are in this place, in this universe. But I think when Jesus is speaking of the world, he's not only talking about that. In fact, he's talking really about something else that has to do with that. And it is the society that we live in. It's what we might call the workaday world, where we struggle to get ahead, competing for resources with each other, and with those who are also trying to get ahead. Placing all the emphasis on the physical objects around us, and that's what happens when we are in this intense competition with each other for the resources of this planet and of this world. So when all of our focus is on these material resources, 
with all of our focus on other people has to do with what we can get from them, suddenly we are not just in the world, but we are of the world at the same time. We are one of the objects in the world in that case. Now I think the coronavirus, because it has separated us, because it has forced us to emphasize material things, because it has put us behind masks and forced us to distance ourselves from one another, has made us tend to be more of the world and to view other people as being of the world and not only just in the world. You know, much of our theological understanding of humanity can go back to a few seminal events in the Garden of Eden. And you may remember that Eve and Adam ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. As the serpent told them, this would make them be like God. Though this is sometimes depicted as a calamity, it actually allowed them to rise above the mere physical world and be able to access the spiritual world. That's how we have become like God, God-like. We have, are in the image of God. Not only were we created in the image of God, but our, by eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, once we can understand those things, we are like God in being able to understand those things. So they were no longer just an animal, but now truly able to live in the image of God. The knowledge they acquired and handed down to us was such that it allowed them to live in a world that they were no longer a part of. In a sense, they were set aside given a special purpose. And what is it called when something is set aside for a special purpose? We just talked about that. It has been sanctified, made holy. So we as people are made holy. We are sanctified just as we ourselves have sanctified this space, right? Set it aside, made it special for a special purpose. And Jesus makes clear in verse 17 of our reading that it is knowledge and understanding that makes people holy. In his prayer, he says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. It was truth that Adam and Eve saw in the Garden of Eden. And it is truth that we get from the word of God. And Jesus continues his prayer. He says to God, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And who's the them he's talking about? It's the disciples, right? These people set aside to do this task, this task to go out into the world and bring God's word into the world. And here is the crucial point. We too, as disciples of Christ, are sent into the world. This passage we are discussing has a great bearing on what has happened to us over the course of the last 14 or 15 months. I think we have been overexposed to the strictly material world, shut away from society. We've been focusing on the physical aspects of who we are and what we're doing. It has lulled us into inaction, made us somnolent, but it has also been kind of an irritant for many of us. I know it's been an irritant to be. I think of it being like laying in bed for too long. You feel tired, but at the same time, you feel achy and you know you really need to get moving. Yes, shut away in our homes. We could pray and we do pray. Yes, we could read the Bible and we do read the Bible. Yes, we could focus on God many a time. Yes, when we have been able to overcome our inertia, we have been able to nurture our vertical relationship with God in that space, in our homes, cut away from each other. We've had that vertical relationship, haven't we? Haven't we? But we have not been able to be in the world. 
We have not been able to be in the world in the sense that we can be with others in society, with others in worship. Jesus sends us into the world, so there is a basic need within us that has not been fulfilled these last 14 months. There is a pent-up desire, a pent-up duty to be in the world and not just be a cog in the machine of the world. We have felt it pushing us, prompting us over these long months of seclusion. I know I have felt it. I know you have felt it. This is why we are so happy to be able to return to live services. This is why we are so happy that we can come back together. We can feel the joy that fills this room when the CDC came out with the announcement about face masks on Thursday. I began to see more and more people's faces and there was joy there. A joy that comes with freedom. But I think also responsibilities that we have in that freedom. People should still be willing to don face masks or distance themselves or refrain from physical contact if it will protect others or even make those others feel comfortable. So even though we gain freedom, we also have a measure of self-control that we can exercise in that freedom. With freedom comes responsibility. You know, we had to be separated for a while, not in a holy way, but so that we could mitigate the spread of the virus. Now that we are together, we are set apart in a different way, made holy for a purpose in the world. And that purpose is to work together to eventually, through the word, through the work of Christ in the world, to change the world, to make it over to God's image, to consecrate the world for God, to make it all holy, not just this space that we're in now, but all the world. That will be a time when there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And we will not only be in the world, but also of that new world, consecrated through the work of God, the Creator, God, the Redeemer, and God, the motivator of all that moves in this world. Amen. gift was to send your loving son to save us. You send your spirit to uplift us and motivate us, and you gave us each other 
to care for and to share in the bounty of your creation. Lord, we are so thankful to be back together in your, this your house. We have not worshiped you in this sanctuary in over a year, and now we contemplate your greatness in this holy place set aside for you. Praise to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord above, you watch over us as we continue our journey through this life. Lord, bring comfort to the sick, bring healing to the injured, bring relief to the anxious. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, there is so much conflict in this world. Struggle never ceases in the Middle East. There is persecution in many nations around the world. Lord, protect those who are attacked without provocation for their faith. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Mighty God, we pray for all those whose relationships are in disrepair. Help friend, neighbor, and family come closer together in harmony. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us now lift up our private concerns to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Now let us pray in the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. May the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do God's will, working among us that which is pleasing in God's sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>